Today I would like to continue um, a series that I started last week, but it's not just a series. It's one of the messages of Hungry Gen and one of the heartbeats of Hungry Gen, and that is the personal relationship with the Holy Spirit. Last week I talked about the Holy Spirit being a person and us developing communion with the Holy Spirit. I also mentioned that you can have a fellowship by talking to the Holy Spirit, but if you have friendship with the Holy Spirit, it's because you're actually doing what the Holy Spirit says. We are an Assemblies of God church. We believe in the Holy Spirit. Some people call us Pentecostals. Some people call us crazy. Some people call us wild. And we believe in the moving of the Holy Spirit, but we also don't believe in weird stuff. Just because Holy Spirit is wild, it doesn't mean things have to be weird. We believe in order. We believe in um, winning souls as the number one priority of the power of the Holy Spirit in the church. The purpose of the Holy Spirit's coming in the church is not for all of us to roll around on the floor, shake and bake. It's for us to win the world for Jesus. Anybody who says, I want Holy Spirit, I want Holy Spirit, and they do not care about people getting winning, winning for Jesus, are missing the whole point. Any church that claims that we all have miracles, we got the power, but if people aren't getting saved, if new people are not meeting Jesus Christ, we're missing the whole point. And so Hungry Gen will always keep people's salvation as the center of everything that we do. Not the manifestations, not even the speaking in tongues, not even the miracles. We believe in them. We welcome all of the moving of the Holy Spirit. But we know that the purpose of it is people meeting Jesus Christ. Can somebody say amen? Otherwise, it just becomes weird. If we don't keep souls being saved, everything will just go crazy bananas, weird off the rails. And that's not what the Hungry Gen is going to be about. That's not what God wants the church to be. The Holy Spirit, today what I want to focus on is slightly different than uh, what I've talked about last week. When we get delivered, when we get saved, God takes us from deliverance to development, from development to our destiny. Let's practice this. Say deliverance, deliverance. development, deliverance. and destiny. Yes. Wilderness is the deliver. Uh, um, Egypt is where the deliverance happens. And then wilderness is where the development happens. We call it discipleship, sanctification. It's where God is working on us, pruning us, changing us, transforming us. He's fashioning us. He's molding us. And then He's bringing us into the destiny. Now destiny is not necessarily you're chilling on the beach somewhere, chillaxing and enjoying retirement. Destiny is serving God. But there's a different shift in that purpose. Same thing happens with the wedding, for example. You get married and then you enter into development called fighting, arguing, disagreeing, where you are wondering, where can I return my husband? Is there a return policy on my wife? Can I get rid of this problem that I have right now? And, but if you endure that, if the Lord works on you, you enter into destiny where you grow together in love and you develop a beautiful family. Same thing happens even with almost everything in life. We go from this point of decision to development and into destiny. Today I want to introduce to you the work of the Holy Spirit in our life in the area of our development in between. Many of us, development for us is being in between. Somebody say in between. It's in between of where we used to be and where we are should be, but we're not there yet. The Holy Spirit wants to help us take us from that place to this place. He wants to help us with development. When we don't allow the Holy Spirit to develop us, we begin to decay. We begin to die slowly in this season, complain, grumble, whine. We begin to turn this season that is difficult and that is challenging into more difficult, more challenging, more harder seasons to the point where sometimes we just don't make it. If you have your Bible, let's go with me to Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 7. This is a reference to Israel being in wilderness, Israel being through that development stage. And it says the following in verse 7. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear my voice, do not harden your hearts. As in the day of rebellion, in the day of development, trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works 
40 years. Now I want you to see this. This is Holy Spirit speaking. He's speaking about himself and he says, I'm going to speak today. Make sure you don't harden your hearts as this happened with your parents. And he's saying, this is what your parents did to me. Now I always saw what Israel went through in the wilderness as more of like this is what they did to Jehovah God, God the Father. And the Holy Spirit was just like on the back seat saying, man, you guys suck. You're horrible. <sighs> Causing all these problems to God. But in here the Holy Spirit reveals actually this is what they were doing to the Holy Spirit. This verse is a quotation from Psalms chapter 25, 95 verses 7 through 11 where the Bible says where the Lord speaks, God speaks, but in Hebrews it says the Holy Spirit speaks. That tells us the Holy Spirit is not just a person, the Holy Spirit is a divine person. Say this with me, say the Holy Spirit is a divine person. Person meaning he has a personality. Person meaning that he is a person you can talk to. He has feelings. He's not a force. He's not a mist. He's not an experience. He's not an atmosphere. And he's not a feeling. He's not something that you just feel. He is a person you can know and experience. But he's also a divine person. Because the Old Testament says, the Lord said, today if you hear my voice, do not harden your heart. In Hebrews it says, the Holy Spirit said, meaning the Holy Spirit of the New Testament is the Lord of the Old Testament. That's why Peter tells Ananias and he says, you lied to God. And then he says in the next verse, you didn't lie to man, you lied to the Holy Spirit. Interchangeably using word God and the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is not just a person, he is a divine person. Christians, we believe in the doctrine of the Trinity. Do we fully understand it? No. Muslims have a big beef with Christianity based on this. They say, you believe in many gods. How could you be a Christian and believe in one God, yet it seems like there is three gods. It's not three gods, it's one God in three persons. Those of you who live in Tri-Cities, it should help you. We have one Tri-Cities, but we have three cities. You're in Kenwick, it's not Pasco. You're in Pasco, that's not Richland. Yet, if you're in Kenwick, you're in Tri-Cities. If you're in Pasco, you're in Tri-Cities. And if you are in Richland, you're in Tri-Cities. So it's one Tri-Cities and it's three Tri-Cities. So which one is that? Both. Now, of course, it's not a best explanation of the Holy Spirit Trinity, but it comes close to us in Tri-Cities to say, you know what, okay, I, I kind of get it. So the Holy Spirit is a person in the Trinity. So we don't have three gods, we have one God in three persons. We don't have three tri-cities, we have one tri-cities with three cities. Okay? Now, for those of you who are like, I still don't get it. Actually, you wouldn't want a God you can completely comprehend. He wouldn't be worthy of worship. I don't understand how a brown cow eats green grass, produces white milk. I still drink it. You don't have to fully comprehend a God who created the galaxies and multi-universes and everything. I mean, incredible being. You can't fit Him into your tiny box. And you don't want God that you have figured out. You want God that you can trust, who deeply loves you and calls you His own. So the Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is a divine person. And the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, we see the Lord says, if you harden your heart when you hear my voice, in Hebrews it says, the Holy Spirit says. This is referring to, this portion of the scripture is referring to Israel's development. They're in between, in the wilderness, in the trial, in a difficult time. And that's exactly what I want to share with you today. There's somebody here today, you came here and you don't know, but God actually prepared you for this service and God is going to speak to you right now. So I'm going to ask you that you open up your heart because He will help you to get through this season of your life. I'm going to share with you four thoughts to take home with you and to practice. Number one, when you're hitting that season, do not surrender to your circumstances, surroundings. Surrender to the Holy Spirit. When you hit a hard time, the enemy will use hard times to make you a hard heart. He will use difficult times to make you difficult. 
when you hit that season where you're in between maybe you're in that season where you're coming out of something you haven't entered something else it's a challenging season it's a difficult season in fact it's a season where one person told me that before the service today where it just sucks it's just difficult it's just not easy and what begins to happen where we make the mistake and where we grieve the Holy Spirit in this season is what Israel did. They grieved God's Spirit. In fact, in Isaiah, it says the following about what Israel did to God's Spirit. Isaiah 63 verse 10. They rebelled and grieved His Holy Spirit. So He turned Himself as an enemy to them. In this season, I always thought that Israel had a big problem with God. Never saw that it was with the Holy Spirit because God says they grieved my spirit in Hebrews it says in the day of your trial in the day of your difficulty he says you hurt me Holy Spirit says you rebelled against me you caused me this so this week I went and I reread the story of Israel's trial in the wilderness and it just started to I started to feel the Holy Spirit it being the one that is being rejected, that is being denied, that is being grieved as they went through a difficult season. And God says, because you grieved my spirit during your development, you grieve your spirit and rebelled against him. God says, intimacy between me and you is broken. He's like, we're not friends, we're foes. And God says, now he says, instead of favoring you, I'm going to fight you. Because God always stands for his spirit. He loves His Spirit and if we don't like the Holy Spirit, if we don't love the Holy Spirit and one of the ways that we grieve the Spirit is when difficult times come and what we do is we surrender to a lesser God which is our problem. We make our problem into a God. We make our problem into something we surrender to and yield to. Now if you're not a Christian, honestly, you don't have many other options but surrender to the doctor's report. Surrender to your diagnosis. Surrender to the symptoms in your body. Surrender to your poverty. Surrender to your heartbreak. You have to surrender because it's big, it's out to get you. But if you have the Holy Spirit, He is greater. Therefore, you don't ignore the problem. You don't ignore the headache, the heartache and all of the stuff. But you say the Holy Spirit is bigger, greater. He is God. I yield to the Holy Spirit. I surrender to the Holy Spirit. I don't know if this situation will change. I don't know what's going to happen. I am not going to have some false hope, but I'm going to have true worship to the God, the Holy Spirit. And I will honor the Holy Spirit and I will surrender to the Holy Spirit. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6, the Bible says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of your cancer. I'm sorry, it doesn't say that. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of your arthritis. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of my kids do not serve God. Many of us got humbled by the mighty hand of our situation. We surrender to our surroundings. We conform to our world. And that grieves the Holy Spirit. Why? Because He's more powerful than your situation. And He doesn't love when we in a difficult situation give our allegiance, our worship, our obsession and all of our emotions get sucked by the vacuum of our problem. He wants us to come and say, Lord, this is very difficult. It's very hard. It's very painful. I don't know what I'm going to do. But when it comes to my worship, when it comes to my allegiance, when it comes to my loyalty, Holy Spirit, I trust in You. I love You and I worship the Father. I worship the Son and I worship the Holy Spirit. I don't worship my problem. I worship my God. I don't worship my feelings. I worship my God. I don't worship my emotions. I worship my God. I don't worship the doctor's report. I love doctors, but I worship God. I don't worship my bank account statement. I worship God. I don't worship the fact that I got sacked a job or somebody broke my heart. I don't worship heartbreak. I worship God. When you worship the Holy Spirit, when the devil is seeking and saying, no, I want you to worship the problem. I want you to obsess with the problem. You honor the Holy Spirit when you surrender to Him, when in reality you should have been surrendering to your problem. Israel, when they went through development, they didn't surrender to the Holy Spirit. They surrendered to their problems. 
they forgot God's past faithfulness. They forgot God's present promise to be with them. And they honestly despised God's future promise. Past faithfulness, presence in the present, future promise. When we surrender to our situation, few things happen. We develop amnesia to what God did. It goes blank. Everything He did in the past no longer matters. We develop this thing where his, pres his presence now doesn't matter. What matters is I have sickness. What matters is I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills. What matters, this person just left me. What matters, my kid is in change. That's what matters. The fact that God, you are with me, that doesn't matter. What you did in the past doesn't matter. And what you promised in the future doesn't matter. And that grieves the Holy Spirit. It's not that the problems don't matter. It's that He's greater than the problem. And he doesn't like when we obsess over molehills and turn them into mountains. Instead of obsessing with someone who created the mountains and can move molehills. In the difficult, most challenging season, fight for your focus. To keep it on the Holy Spirit. Fight for your focus to surrender to the Holy Spirit. Your situation might not change, so don't let it change your focus. The devil might stand there and say, you will die from this sickness. And you say, devil, take this because I'm going to die in faith. I'm going to die trusting God. If that's going to be my lot, king, great king, you shall know to your gods I will not bow and your idols I will not serve. I will serve my God. I will serve my Lord. He is greater than any problem. But what if he doesn't change anything? If I die, I'm going to see him. So I'm going to be still happy. I'm going to still be a winner with God. And devil, you will go to hell. I'm not saying for you to go all crazy on the devil. Just a little bit. When he reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. When he reminds you how bad your life, remind him how bad he's going to have. And say, you think I have it bad? <laughs> Where you're headed? <sighs> really, really bad for eternity. Surrender to the Holy Spirit. How do you surrender when times get hard? You remember God's past faithfulness. Count God's blessings one by one. Remember what He has done. Remember His present presence. God always tells us don't be afraid and He gives us usually one reason. You would think the reason will be, oh, because everything will be fine. You will go to the doctor, everything will be fine. Oh, you're about to get a money in the check. God doesn't always give us that reason. He only gives us really one main reason. And he says, I am with you. But, but, but what about this? God says, you got me. But what about, you got me. I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I fear no evil because you are with me. It doesn't say because the valley will not be very long. God says to Joshua, He says, when you enter the promised land, be strong, courageous, because I am with you wherever you go. Jesus says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And He says, Lo, I am with you until the end of age. That means that you have a reason not to be afraid. And that reason is God's presence present with you right now through the power of the Holy Ghost. Somebody say, surrender to the Holy Spirit not to your surroundings. Number two, don't test the Holy Spirit. Don't try the Holy Spirit. Trust the Holy Spirit. Hebrews chapter 3, it says this, they tried me and they tested me. The Bible actually tells us we can test God in tithing. So the only place we can test God is in tithing. Every other place, we're not allowed to test God. Why? Because when you test something, you're challenging it, its authority, its intention. Satan tested Jesus and says, turn rocks into bread. Pharisees challenged Jesus and they said, give us a sign, ignoring all these signs Jesus did. People challenged Jesus on the cross says, come down from the cross, we'll believe you. Jesus never played magic, never did magic for entertainment. Jesus will never perform tricks to satisfy your skepticism. Why does God not do that? Because God doesn't like to be tried and tested. He's not Costco's simple. Now I understand some of you and I heard some of our testimonies. 
I tried everything and then I came to God and I said, Jesus, I'm going to try you. And I get it. God understands that. But if that is your relationship with God, is you're trying God. He's not an AOL internet that you can try for 30 days and then return it back. God is not on trial and He doesn't like to be tried. He loves to be trusted. Now, something I want to share with you that liberated me personally about a year ago. In the development, in the times of testing, trial and hardship for us, I used to feel guilty for not having faith. The difference between faith and trust, as Pastor Howe and Leah in the book Generations outlines, is that faith is active, trust is passive. Faith says, God, I got you. Trust says, God, you got me. Faith is aggressive. Push through the crowd, woman with the issue of blood, touch the hem of his garment, pow, healed. Faith is, I'm standing on the promise, I'm pushing through, come hell high water, man, I, I'm standing on the solid rock, that's faith. But when you hit the grinder, that's gone. <laughs> You're like, man, I ain't got enough energy to get out of bed. I have a hard time to stay sane. Like, I ain't got energy to fight. And then you can meet the other believer who's like, no man, you got the spiritual warfare, but weapons right here, man. You gotta go to war. You're like, no, I, I can't make it. And then of course they guilt trip you and they say, no, that's why you're gonna get stuck. Nope. In the trial time, you rarely will have energetic faith. You will have passive trust and that pleases the Holy Spirit. He knows it's hard. He knows it's difficult. And passive trust is the greatest form of warfare and faith when hell breaks loose. It's when the sickness is progressing and instead of you just claiming the verses and I curse the sickness, da, 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 you kind of did all of that and honestly you're out of it already. And you have this quiet confidence. Not that you got God. You're past that now. God got me. Not that you're surrendering to the sickness and saying, no Lord, cancer, that's just my identity. No, no, no. You're not sick person trying to get healthy. You're a healthy person fighting sickness. You're not a poor person trying to get blessed. You're a blessed person fighting poverty. You're not a weak person trying to get strong. You're a strong person fighting weakness. Your identity is not in your issue. Your identity is in the Holy Spirit. But sometimes you hit that season where all of that fighting, all of that pressure, all of that pressing in, all of that, you're tired. You're exhausted. And the devil will lie to you and say, God will never manifest His power in your life because you don't have that aggressive faith. But I'm here to remind you that Proverbs 3, 5, it says, trust in the Lord. Meaning sometimes you can't just fight anymore, but you can passively lean and rest on God. God got me. He's got my health. He's got my family. He's got my crazy children. He's got my spouse. He's got my finances. I trust in Him. And I'm not no longer even praying for them. Not because I don't believe it. I just trust God got it. God got it. God's got it. He's got it. What's going to happen? I don't know. God's got it. Oh, but you're being irresponsible. No, this is protects my sanity. It protects my peace because he who trusts in God, the Bible says, and not leans on his understanding, God will see you through. Sometimes your faith is like the centurion, send the word and my servant will be healed. Sometimes your faith is like Bartimaeus, son of David. And sometimes it's like a trust of a paralyzed man. Jesus comes to him, he's not even asking for healing. Jesus says, do you want to be healed? He says, and it almost seems like he has no, just bunch of excuses. And sometimes we're in that place and I just, I don't want to condone doubt, skepticism. I just want to encourage that when it's hard to fight in faith, rest in trust. Just lay down your weapons and say, Lord, I've done the best I can. I can't walk anymore. Carry me please. And I lean 100. God, 
I'm dropping, I'm falling and I'm afraid I will hit the rock bottom. Could you catch me before I do? That's trust. When I get on the airplane, I trust the seat. I trust the pilot. I don't bark orders. I don't hit the door every five seconds if he's awake. I relax and I trust that the pilot is not drunk. He's not a terrorist. He's not going to fly that plane into a building. And I fall asleep. And I wake up in a different destination. Sometimes in the development, that's all you have to do is trust He's got you. Don't try Him. Don't test Him. Don't try to say, God, if, if you don't do that in next I give you 30 days, I will not believe you. Trust me. He created the universe. You can't intimidate Him with threats. <laughs> you can't push this thing. If you come down right now, like some people like to make arguments, God, but if you heal me, I will do this. It's, it's like God over there in heaven struggling financially. And really that, that, that thing from you is going to make a big deal for God. God is testing us sometimes by letting us realize we need to learn to trust. And there are seasons in my life where I fought in prayer, yelling, screaming, speaking in tongues, confessing, stomping on the snake, walking around my mountain seven times and then shouting seven times more. And yeah, but as I'm getting older, a lot of that hype <laughs> begins to fade. And a lot of times when hell breaks loose, stuff hits the fan, and I grab to my seat, I buckle up <laughs> with the truth and I said, Jesus, you're still here? And I hear the witness, yes I am. I said, God, we're still on, we're still on the track? Yes we are. Okay God, I'm closing my eyes. <laughs> I'm going to sleep, you stay awake and worry. <laughs> it's passive trust. It's strong when you're struggling. People will blame you and say, oh you don't understand until they hit the stuff. And then they'll come back to you saying, I don't believe in God anymore. I can't go to church. You're like, huh? Yeah, it's easy to judge somebody who's going through something you're not going through and give them instructions on what they should do. But sometimes you're going through the difficult season and you, all you can do is silently trust. Job had a lot of questions to God. And we judged Job. We were like, man, he had a lot of doubts. But you know, Job said this, I know my Redeemer lives. Meaning, has got me. And he said, in my flesh, I will see God. Meaning, in my future, the devil isn't showing up. That's what real trust is. Trust is not, trust is expecting God will show up in my future. I don't know how. I don't know how he will make the appearance. I know he's showing up in my future. Fear says the devil will show up and mess everything up like he did the last time. Faith says, trust says, I trust God will show up in my future. During your trial, during your development, trust the Holy Spirit when you can no longer exercise active, aggressive, passionate, vibrant, Pentecostal, charismatic faith. Just trust in Him. Number three, the Holy Spirit will develop you during development if you replace complaining with communion. Grumbling with gratitude. Whining with worship. What messed Israel up and what really grieved the Holy Spirit, if you will look in the Israel's development story, was this one thing. They used their mouth to grieve the Holy Spirit. And how did that do that? They used their mouth as a thermometer to always notify the Lord of what they felt. And that grieved God. It's okay to process things. It's okay to, in worship, come to God and express your feelings. David did that in Psalms. It's another thing when you develop it as a part of your routine, your habit, and your character to be a whiny, complaining, grumpy, negative, toxic individual. Jesus went through wilderness. He felt, he felt pain. He felt hunger. There were wild animals there. Satan was tempting him and you don't see Jesus vomiting his feelings. You see Jesus speaking God's Word. 
You don't always have to say what you feel. I know our culture that worships therapy and counseling and you know process your feelings. You always have to talk about your feelings. I get that that has its place but some of us have been developed this thing where everything that comes to our head comes out of our mouth. To the point we have become chronically complaining people. And then this chronic complaining becomes something that we become those people. Where now people around us, they know, yeah, she's always going to complain. Yeah, the guy's always unhappy, always mad at somebody, always unangry, never grateful for anything. Complaining to the devil is what worship is to God. Worship, God inhabits it. Satan inhabits grumbling. No wonder when Israel grumbled, snakes came. When you worship, the dove comes. When you complain, serpents come. And guess what the serpents do? They bite. What do they do with their bite? It's not just something like a mosquito. Ah, it hurts. And then you stop scratching it, it goes away. When snakes bite, they release venom. Venom goes into your system and it begins to shut things down in your system. When demonic spirits, they attach, they are in love, they are attracted to complaining, constantly grumbling people. The more you complain, the more you grumble, the more you are negative all the time. What begins to happen is the dove, the Holy Spirit begins to withdraw because the Bible says do everything without grumbling. It says that. The Holy Spirit loves thanksgiving. Enter into God's courts not with whining but with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, gratitude, being worshipped, being alive, that you're being grateful that you are alive, that you are God's child, that you are forgiven. Yes, everything else might not be good but you're headed to heaven. Holy Spirit lives inside of you and you focus on those good things and you're being grateful something happens. The presence of God is more like attracted to worship. But the moment you switch, constant complaining, whining, this is bad, this is bad. Oh but he doesn't love me, but she doesn't love me. That person and you this, this offense, this bitterness and then you do that, you do that for a while. The Holy Spirit's presence withdraws. He doesn't leave you. His sweet presence does. The Holy Spirit doesn't leave us when we grieve Him. It's His manifest presence lifts us. The same way if you grieve your spouse, they don't divorce you. They'll just be distant from you. No, not distance, meaning that they'll move across the country. It's just you will be in bed with them this close and you are as far from them as east is from the west. Why? Because emotional distance happens. When we grieve the Spirit, we feel distant from Him. It's not that He is far from us. It's like a grieving spouse. They are distant emotionally and distant in the heart. But they're not distant. That They're not gone. They're there. When you chronically, constantly complain like Israel did, the Holy Spirit is grieved. He won't tell you a lot of times He's grieved. In fact, He will leave. You won't even know He left. How do I know the Holy Spirit is grieved? Peace of mind is gone instantly. Secondly, the soul no longer has stillness. A lot of irritation comes in. And what begins to happen, what else there? The sweetness of the Holy Spirit whew, is gone. I know I'm saved. I know I'm going to heaven, except I'm currently living in hell right here. Like over there, just everything is just like there. And then you're mad, you're angry. There's no sweetness anymore. There's no stillness there anymore. Mind becomes foggy. There's no clarity anymore. He doesn't announce his departure. When he left Saul, Saul never got the memo. When he left Samson, Samson never got the letter. Hey, in three days I'm leaving. He just departed and the Bible says, and Saul did not even know. And sometimes you feel afterwards, what do you feel? What Saul, what Samson did. Yeah, I'm gonna, I got this. Oh, psh, got beaten. Oh, oh, this doesn't work anymore. Why? The sweet presence left. But the amazing part, it can always come back. If we repent, if we realign our life. But as His presence departs, guess what begins to happen? There is a short window of opportunity when the sweetness of His presence is gone. And this is a time where the big alarm sounds to the demonic kingdom. I'm available. I'm open. Open season. Anybody out there, come and attack me. That's really what's happening. Because in that moment, bitterness, offense, 
blah, blah, and you like start a little bit manifesting, you know, like, blah, and you stay in that season long enough, venom begins to come into your system. Give it 24 hours, you hate your spouse. I can't stand it. Oh, he's not this. Blah, blah, blah. Give it 42 hours, 40, 48 hours. Next thing happens, you want to kill him. Give 72 hours, you researching what to put into the soup. Give seven days, you're already on the couch thinking, man, should have married the other girl in high school. What was I thinking? It was stupid me. I knew I made a mistake. My parents told me I was making a mistake. And now you know that you, you have a mistake. Give it two, three weeks and you're gone. Venom already shutting different stuff in our life. Why? Because when the dove leaves, serpents come. That's why in the same portion of the scripture where it says, do not grieve the spirit, few verses before that it says, don't give place to the devil. Those two things always work together. We're not talking about salvation. We're talking about bondage or blessing. When the sweetness of His presence is there, there is a protection that exists against the demonic. When we grieve His Spirit, He doesn't announce His departure. It's just we begin to feel lack of that peace, lack of that joy, lack of that righteousness, lack of that. And if we don't take caution and say, God, I need you. Like David, he says, Lord, take not your spirit from me. I saw what happened to Saul. Told God, please take the crown, take everything, but please do not take your presence from me. I need that back. Clean my spirit, purge me, break me, mold me, do whatever you need to do. God, I need that. I can't function without that. King Saul, on the other hand, when that happened, completely oblivious. And the Bible says, distressing spirit comes, starts tormenting him. The guy is just literally having manic episodes, throwing spears at everybody. And he doesn't register. The dove is gone. And I got snake venom everywhere. And you know what Saul does the rest of his life for 20 years? Chases David thinking that his problem is David. If I can only kill David, all of my problems will be gone. And instead of looking for a prophet or prayer line or something, he's looking for a musician who can play music so that his demons could be comforted. And that's why God never delivered him and the dove never came back. I want to encourage you today. Do not develop complaining, grumbling, anger, resentment. We all fall into that. All of us. But the difference between people who keep a relationship with the Holy Spirit, they don't give a long gap between their sin and their repentance. We all mess up, all of us, myself included. But if we bridge the gap between when we messed up and we know in our heart, our conscience is just like eating us alive. Like no, and then you want to go and watch a movie and some people go get drunk, do whatever they need to do, silence that. Do not silence that. That's the mercy of God telling you the dove is leaving. Wake up. And if you do that, the dove will come back. Now, I'm not saying the Holy Spirit left. His sweet presence has. The Holy Spirit rested on Jesus and the Bible says He remained on Jesus because Jesus never once did anything, thought nothing that grieved the Spirit. The dove always stayed on Him. But He doesn't always stay on us because we, well, we're humans. <sighs> Communion is more important than complaining. Gratitude is more important than grumbling. Worship is more important than whining. Now, does, does that mean we can never complain? Of course we can. Make sure it doesn't become a habit. And make sure it doesn't become a routine. And make sure we give ourselves two minutes and come out of that. Not like give ourselves 20 years and become it. Because what complaining does is this. It allows our soul to have a field day. The more you have your soul have a field day, you become soulish and carnal. As a Christian, you have a spirit, soul, and the body. Your spirit can get strengthened in the Holy Spirit, can tell your soul, hey, uh, behave. David did that. Remember David says, bless the Lord, O my soul. So David is speaking to his soul. He's not living in his soul. David would speak to his soul and say, why are you so discouraged? What's up with that? You woke up this morning all cranky and stuff. 
he says, for I yet will praise the Lord. So he's telling Saul, you, I know you're cranky. I know you're not feeling good right now. I just want to give you a heads up. Uh, the orders come from the headquarters and the headquarters is the Spirit telling you, you're gonna do what we need to do. And that is, we're gonna praise God. So you get on with it. We're praising God. Your little pity party stuff is over. When you complain and you grumble, what happens is your spirit gets pushed aside and your soul is the one that, yeah, this is what's happening, this is what's happening. And the soul always just reflects the circumstances. But when you allow the spirit to lead your soul, speak to your soul, direct your soul. Sometimes it could be literally like you speaking to yourself. And this is not weird. Some of you are like, man, this is kind of weird. It's in the Bible. David did that. And most of you speak to stuff anyway. You speak to your car, you speak to your cat, you speak to your fridge, you speak to your taco, you speak to your phone, you speak to other stuff. So just, you might as well speak to yourself. And sometimes you got to encourage yourself. The Bible says David strengthened himself. So when you're going through stuff and you realize your soul is over there making its own stuff, wants to have a speech. Can I have a 30 minute speech? You're like, wait, wait, hold on. Let me see your script. When your soul wants to express all of its emotions, many people do not have borders and do not have a border patrol in their life. We need to have that because whatever happens here, we don't have to let it always come out of there in our mouth. The Bible says what comes out of the mouth defiles a man. And some of us unfortunately destroy with our mouth what we're building with our hands. Come on, how many arguments we had in our marriages, there was only because of this. If we would have only zipped the lip and just kind of nodded, avoided the fight. You can't catch a fish with its mouth closed. Sometimes the best remedy is silence. It's to just kind of say, no, I'm not feeling good right now. And if I'm going to open my mouth, somebody is going to get hurt. So I'd rather not do that. I got to calm this down. Give me a break. Let me go for a, around the neighborhood. Deliver myself from these demons that are attaching, attacking me right now. And come back so I can say something sweet. The Israel said a lot of nasty stuff. They said, God, you left us. God, we missed the cucumbers. We left the garlic. Really? You want to go back to Egypt for garlic? Are you kidding me? You got beaten there for hundreds of years. Literally made slaves. Didn't have a day off. And all you're missing is garlic? God, you left us. What kind of God you are? You're not taking us anywhere. You lied to us. Da, 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 da. All of this stuff. They felt that. Trust me, everybody did. They didn't have to always say it. I believe that we can silence the voice of those negative feelings by the help of the Holy Spirit. How do I know that? Because what is the area the Holy Spirit affects when He fills you? Why do we have to learn to speak more and more in tongues? Because our tongue is the last thing we can control. We can't. But when the Holy Spirit fills it, He begins to control it. And a lot of us need to speak more in tongues and less in English. Because when we speak in English, a lot of nasty stuff comes out. I'm not against us speaking in English. I'm not saying come to your family and say, no, I'm so mad. I'm just going to speak in tongues to you right now. Uh, not that part. But what I'm saying is that if every day we take time to speak in tongues, what begins to happen is that when we feel tempted to say something with our tongue that is painful, the Holy Spirit will pull the e-brakes. Oh, hold, hold on. Keep that thought. Don't let it come out. Because once it comes out, World War III will start. We don't need that. And hold it there. And you hold it, and next thing that happens, the Lord preserves us. Amen. 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 And the last thing that I want to mention, and that is, develop sensitivity to the Holy Spirit when, you, when your sight fails you. When you don't see what you want to see as a Christian, and now the Holy Spirit wants you to see that. I want you to notice what Hebrews chapter 3 verse 7 says. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, when you are in development, when you are in the most difficult season of your life, when you are in between places, you typically will only see in front of you bad, darkness, challenging situation like Israel, problems, no water, no food, no meat, no cucumbers, no garlic, no other food. And then they get, they get the report about the promised land. And the report is pretty exaggerated. But the report is things are actually worse in the promised land than they are here. So when, what you see in development 
season in between place a lot of times is just hard spouse is hard children are difficult to raise uh, maybe you're dealing at the same time with children young children and elderly parents and it seems hard you're looking at your finances and it's very hard you looked at your gas prices it's very hard the cost of food is it's, it's very painful everything seems to be painful hard and difficult so your sight what we see is very difficult but what I love Holy Spirit for is in the development he doesn't change what we see he changes what we hear that's why it says as the Holy Spirit says because when the, what I see is bad he doesn't come and change what I see he starts to speak to me and what I hear changes I'll give you an example Bartimaeus was blind most likely he was blind all his life what he saw was bad. In fact, it was dark. He saw that every day. He saw that for lunch. He saw that for dinner. He saw that when he was a teenager. He saw that when he was a young man. And most likely he would be seeing that for the rest of his life. But did you know when the turning point happened in Bartimaeus? Nothing changed with his sight. The Bible says, and Bartimaeus heard Jesus. Your hearing is going to be the key to change what you're seeing if what you're seeing hasn't been changing. That's why it says the Holy Spirit speaks. Why is He speaking? Because the only way He can change what you're seeing with your health, with your family, with your finances is by speaking to you. But what we do many times when everything is dark and we are in between place, we say, Lord, change what I see. Open my eyes, open my eyes. But what we need to be doing is saying, Lord, help me to open my ears to hear what you are saying. Bartimaeus heard the Lord, cried out to the Lord. He didn't ask Jesus for an explanation. Like if this would have been some of us, we would be like, Jesus, why was I born blind? Well, it's not a like you can ask for an explanation or you can get a miracle and Bartimaeus is like yeah I will ask for explanation when I die and go to heaven right now he's nearby God is walking by I'm not gonna waste my prayer to ask for an explanation I need a miracle how did that miracle came through his hearing he heard Jesus faith comes by hearing the Holy Spirit speaks the Bible says so as I go through a difficult time and everything is dark everything is bad I don't know where to go I'm confused I'm lost I'm trying to go this way I'm trying to go that way I don't know where to go I don't have a direct verse in the Bible of what to do next I'm asking this person and that person everybody's giving me contradictory answers honestly I'm confused I'm lost and everything is dark what do I do open your ears because the Holy Spirit won't be showing he'll be speaking as Bartimaeus heard the Lord and then Jesus called Bartimaeus, something happened. The Bible says Bartimaeus' eyes were opened and he followed him. Meaning the direction where to go next came after something changed in his sight which came from him hearing first. When we are lost, when we are stuck, when we are confused, when we feel like it's bad, dark and it's gonna get worse, we go into panic mode but instead we should develop sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. We should develop hearing to the Holy Spirit because hearing will unlock seeing. Same thing happened with Apostle Paul. He meets Jesus, goes blind completely. And God comes to another disciple, Ananias, and he says, uh, Ananias, Paul is in that house. Here's the address. He says, he saw you in the vision. I'm thinking, how did Paul see you in the vision when he's blind? Because see, though his physical eyes were closed, something else was opened. They say that blind people a lot of times develop sensitivities in their ears. They're so sharp. Their senses, other senses are beginning to work way better than their sight because they cannot rely on the sight. So they rely on their sound so much more. When you feel like what you're seeing is bad, God will get you out of that season through your hearing. Hear. Listen. Pay attention to the Holy Spirit. Follow the whispers of the Holy Spirit. Follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Discern the moving of the Holy Spirit and you will see how He will change you and then change what you see. How do you do that? Well, how did Paul saw when he was blind? A verse before that, it says, Paul was praying. That means we pray until we hear. We pray, I like to say this, I read until I feed myself. 
I read until He speaks, until peace comes into my heart, until assurance comes. I don't have what to do. I don't know what the next step to do. What I just know is I'm all right. Holy Spirit is with me. Everything is going to be okay. And the next thing that happens is the seeing begins to unfold. You step in and God begins to give you just enough to see. So you step into that. Kind of like when you drive in the dark, the light from your car does not light up the way from your present place to your destination. It just lights up just enough so you can get there. And once you're there, it pushes more light and gives you more light on the road and more light on the road. I want to encourage you today that in the most difficult season of our life, the Holy Spirit wants to fill us. He wants us to have our mouth be pure. Pure doesn't always mean that we speak King James Version of our Bible. Pure means that we're positive. Pure and not positive that we're oblivious to the problems, walk around saying, no, I don't have a sickness. That's, that's not faith. That's stupidity. Because if you have sickness, you have sickness. There's no need to lie about it. And that's not faith. Faith simply says, I'm healthy fighting sickness. Fear says, I'm sick and I'm going to die from this. An oblivious, crazy uh, faith that is not faith says, no, I don't have any sickness. I'm not going to take any medication. Seek medical help. So we're not on that side. We're just trusting in Jesus. We don't surrender to our sickness. We don't surrender to our problem. We don't surrender to our issue. When things get harder, we keep our mouth full of positive things. We communicate with the Holy Spirit. And when our faith fails and we're like, I can't believe anymore. It's very hard. We rest in the trust as we get and we get seated in the trust for God. And we say, Lord, I trust you. I can't trust you, but I trust you. How do we get out of this? You listen. You listen. Why? Because he knows what you're going through. He will decide when that what you're going through comes to an end. And he will whisper something and he will say, Bartimaeus, come here. He will say to Israel, cross the Jordan and everything changes. Think things will change. Your life will change and the Holy Spirit will do His work through and in you in Jesus' name. In our jobs, in our careers. But the most important is not the changes that He makes. The most important is the development of relationship that we have as a result of that. You know, our marriage changed. When we first got married, you know, it was such a happy day. It was my dream, you know, to, to get married. Actually, for a long time, I thought I'll never get married. <laughs> I thought I was ugly. And uh, I just didn't know the girls don't necessarily look. I mean, they like to flirt with guys that are good looking. They just don't marry them. <laughs> Somebody should have told me that. <clears throat> but I didn't know that. So they look more about what's in your wallet and what's in your brain than actually how your face looks. But again, nobody told me that. So I finally, you know, married this beautiful girl and, you know, like very, very happy. And then, and then hell breaks loose. Not that she was the hell that broke loose. It's just, you know, demons were attacking her. And then, you know, I thought I was so self-righteous because, you know, I was a virgin on a, um, you know, all the way till our wedding night and, um, and stuff. So I thought that was, there was like this special thing where I didn't need to crucify myself. I could be impatient. I could be arrogant. I could be just coming in like, why are you sleeping till seven o'clock? You're not praying. Da, da, da. So, I mean, I did all the stuff that you shouldn't do. And it was, it was very hard. And after I was done with all of that, you know, the Lord started to work on my heart. He started to change me as a person. He started to cut off a lot of that ugliness that nobody had to confront in me because nobody was that close. And it was painful. It was very painful. But it was necessary because the development season is very important. It's to change us. And I'm not going to lie to you. There were times I had lies coming this close in my head, like, like right there, knocking on my door and saying, I'm not going to leave. And the lies were, you married the wrong person. Um, man, you should have not married her. You know, she's from Vancouver and all of this stuff. And she, you're from here. You didn't even know her. You got a cat in the bag. And you know, like that, all of the lies, like crazy stuff. I won't tell you everything that knocked on, my, on the doors of my, my, my mind. And, but I remember I, I made a decision. I said, I will not let that in. That could come and tempt me, but that's not going to come out of my mouth. And that's not going to come into my heart. And so... Um, I made the right decision. Uh, I married the right person. And I said that at the time. The person that I married is God's choice for me, period. Not going to change that. And then my wife goes through her deliverance. I go through my brokenness, through my sanctification and everything. And we started to step into a new season. Our marriage is not perfect. Not, not the furthest thing, but the relationship that developed through that season is solid. 
and it's that that relationship is healthy that relationship brings me joy the relationship I developed with God through that season became so close I realized how messed up I am and though I didn't need deliverance from drugs but sometimes self-righteousness arrogance and nasty attitude is as bad as other stuff and the Holy Spirit come through and started to bring that deliverance and that development that happened I'm still being developed please don't I'm not walking around here look, look at me I've reached my destiny no that's not there's still a lot of areas that are still being developed but in some areas I see the breakthrough I would say similar thing in the ministry there was a time of 10 to 15 years where there was a very heavy heavy development and it was hard and it was hard and yes at first there was a lot of yelling and screaming we're gonna have a revival we're gonna da 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 da, da. I mean we took uh, virgin oil and oil, dropped it in front of the nightclubs you know so that everybody will come in and will slip into the presence of God <coughs> and you know did all of this stuff very aggressive like I remember I was in high school Pasco High stapled a thousand flyers on my hall bringing everybody to our youth rally nobody came except I almost got kicked out of the school you know like and this is this like passionate aggression ah, 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 let's go and stuff and so and then after about like 10 years of doing all of this stuff and I was like <sighs> kind of tired <laughs> is anything ever gonna change and the Holy Spirit started to deal with idols you know do you want revival because you love people you want revival is because you want to be famous no God don't go there all of that started to get exposed and started to break things and then the big thing happened, as I've shared to you many times, when he put on my heart, my wife's, and he, he knew exactly the area that was like super sensitive for me, and that was money. I was like a religious tither, like a Pharisee. You know, I only tithe, I would never give a dollar about my tithe. Like I was strict Pharisee. And the Lord, I think it was the Lord, I knew it was the Lord now, put on my heart to take the savings and empty it. And I fought with it, and I, because that was breaking point for me. It had nothing to do with money. It had to do with my heart being attached and me being materialistic. But I thought because I don't make a lot of money, I'm not materialistic. The fact that I was attract, addicted to that money and the Lord brought that up and I flared up like, oh, 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 how dare you talk to me about that stuff? You know, and I rebuked the voice and I rebuked the, that's, that's not from God. God doesn't steal, kill and destroy. You know, here, this thing coming to me right now wants to take my savings. I rebuked it in Jesus' name. All of that nonsense. And then of course, when I come down, and I realized, yeah, I don't think it's the devil who wants me to, who wants me to give to the missions. <laughs> and I was like, and I don't think this is God who's getting all flared up about the fact that I should be more generous. And I'm like, but I don't want to confront the fact that I got a little ugly green monster living right here. How can a Pentecostal boy like me have that? Where has this monster been living? In the basement of my Pentecostal faith. <laughs> and he came up. And man, I remember when the Lord had to confront that and deal with that and, and it was painful, died million deaths. Pruning had to happen. That's the development. That's the development. And so, and if you walk away from this saying, no, I'm not going to allow that. You know, it's kind of like leaving a surgery, open heart surgery in the middle of the surgery. Say, no, this is too hard. I'm leaving. You got, you got to stay on the table and say, Lord, I'm yours. Holy Spirit, change me. Holy Spirit, I want to be more like Jesus. I don't want to live American dream. I want to fulfill your purpose for my life. I want my life to be a living sacrifice on the altar. And Jesus, if there are idols and there are good idols that I really like, uh, Jesus, but please take it slow. <laughs> Not all at once. <laughs> give me, give, give, please be patient with me. And uh, Lord, please don't leave me. But Lord, be patient with me. I will come around, but please help me. And Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, will work on us. He will speak when we can't see. And then our circumstances change. And then we begin to follow the Lord. Now we know clearly where we need to go. But even then, God takes us deeper and God takes us higher. Some of us have sensitivity. We are overly sensitive. People walk on eggshells around us. And we should stop that because we should stop taking ourselves too seriously. Instead, we should take the Holy Spirit seriously and make sure that we are sensitive to Him. Let people hurt your feelings once in a while. You're not that important. But make sure that we don't hurt His feelings because He's that important. But many of us, we made ourselves into a big Holy Spirit. Nobody can hurt us, but we can walk around and hurt Him. I don't want to be that. I want to be a person that I don't take myself seriously, but I take Holy Spirit seriously. Amen. Thanks for watching this sermon. 
If this was a blessing to you, would you let me know in the comments below what stood out to you from this message? What are you taking home with you from this message? Also, if you enjoyed these messages, would you help us and hit thumbs up for this video and subscribe to our channel so you can get new videos every single week delivered to you on your YouTube app. If you go to hungrygen.com forward slash sermons, you'll actually be able to download the transcript, the notes, and the quotes of this sermon and the rest of all of our sermons free of charge. Until next time.